Okay, now we're recording. So there were three topics that have been coming up over and over and um, it's in crisis, insurance and staffing. And I know you have been presenting to the Board of Ed and we've been sharing all those thoughts with the other members of the town council. But I think there are still some issues and questions and I sent you some um, in those emails. So we'll just focus on the ones that relate to what we're talking about today. Sure. But I think the kids in crisis um, We'll start with that. And I think the town council wanted to kind of know a little history, um, which you gave, and I really listened to, but I, if you could do it again, I think that would be I, could, I, I brought my notes. So okay. I'd be glad to. <laughs> It was really, it was really helpful, but honestly, it was so much to absorb hearing it a second time. I actually might get it. <laughs> All right. Then I'll try to say the same thing. Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you for inviting us. And I'm always glad to go through and, and talk about our budget. And we, while we haven't had a chance in writing to respond to the questions as they've been coming in, um, we certainly will do that. And, but I also having, having read through them and then flipped through them. Um, we're comfortable talking about any of those questions. You know, it's just it would just be the process of getting to on paper for a meeting. But um, so we're glad that the conversation is you, Sean, for for joining us. Um, so, question number one around the kids in crisis counselor at SACS. And before we go there, uh, what I did last night was just sort of back us up a little bit to give a bit of a bit of history, and then we'll get to where we are today and what we're thinking about for next year. Is that all right? With yep. That's okay. right. Uh, so. We've had a kids in crisis counselor at the high school, I believe, since at least 2008. Uh, so it's a long-standing position. Uh, when I became principal of the high school in 2011, the position was there, and that position has uh, served us well through the years. The when the pandemic hit, the state provided us with COVID-related grants that were short-term. Uh, they, there was a two-year window when we received, we were first mm -hmm. notified of the grants. Things have changed and evolved over time, but initially the, those grants were there. And they gave us very specific ways that we could use the grant money. Uh, some communities received significant amounts of funding through the grants, 150 million plus. Um, we received about a million. So it's- was I'm sorry, we, we received how much? About a million. Okay, thanks. And I'm just, you know, just to give the history of it, you know, we're not, um, well, good. So we, and they gave us the ways in which we could use that, those funds. And there were uh, a couple of different categories, whatever. So as we were planning and thinking about how we could use those funds, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Pierce, and he mentioned that at a Health and Human Services meeting, this is July, 2021, now, they were talking about uh, the, potential benefit of a kids and crisis counselor at SACS. So we met, we talked, and we decided, yes, that it fits in the way, the use of grant funding. Um, and we said, yes, that we would be uh, interested in running that as a pilot for two years, uh, that we would fund through the grant with the understanding that if the pilot was successful, uh, then it would roll over to the town and the town would fund it as we have been funding the kids and crisis counselor at the high school. So since certainly before my time this was set up, the funding for the, that one position at high school has come from the Health and Human Services budget. Um, so we've never received any voice on that or anything else. And what happens is at the end of the year when things are uh, trued up, it gets charged to us as an in-kind. So it's still part of the funding received from the town to the Board of Ed, but it's done just through that as part of our per pupil lease, right? So, but it doesn't wasn't in our budget. So um, we agreed, starting July 21, that we'd give it a try. Uh, we were unable to find the right person for that whole school year. So 21, 22, we looked, we interviewed multiple people. We did not find a kids in crisis counselor for SACS in that school year. The, in the summer of 22, we did find the right person. And that person joined uh, the SACS uh, staff, so to speak, and we uh, have paid, we paid that annual cost in 22, 23, the $96,000 directly from the grant as we had discussed. In, um, and then based on our prior understanding from 21, we had anticipated that the town had budgeted 1.0 
in the help needed services for this exposition for 23 24, which is where we are this year. Because right? we said we do it two years, we can find somebody the first year, and we had done it. We also had made that decision because the grant, remember, was supposed to be a two year grant, and then they did extend it for a third year. They pushed it out, but when we made those original decisions and expenditures, whenever it was a two year grant. So in September, we learned that the Kids in Crisis Council of Positions High School was um, vacant. And so since the Kids in Crisis Council of the High School is vacant, and the town had budgeted 1.0 for kids in crisis counselor overall. In, in an email, we, just, we agreed the town would fund this exposition until they found the high school position, at which point the grant would kick up and we'd pay the remainder. Right, so we agreed that we would do that. Then the high school position was um, hired around November, give or take. And after I believe 32,000 was paid towards kids in crisis with, for the sex position, because that had been there the whole time. After we met with a few others from the town, we agreed how to provide funding for the two kids in crisis counselors for the remainder of this year. Um, that's the, the 64 will come from the grant, 32 that they currently have. Um, and then the town will continue to pay for the 1.0 that was in the budget, which is whether it's Saxon High School, whatever. We have 2.0 kids in crisis counselors now um, for the remainder of this school year. And the money Sorry. is the budget. Where does that budget and money sit? In our COVID grant okay. that expires at the end of this school year. 64. And that's where the 64 is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, the other money uh, funding came from the um, the town's health and human services budget, which had budgeted 1.0. So it's what they had budgeted um, for this school year. And then we are picking up the 64 and they'll pay the remaining 64 for the position that was hired, however exactly works out based on the day it's hired. So we are, um, we have 2.0 for the remaining of the school year. COVID grant will be paying for one of those positions for the rest of the year, and the health and human services budget pays for the rest. Okay. Can I just ask a question? So sure. that's a lot of moving parts. Thank you for going in that, you know, that explanation. So there was something at the Board of Finance that said the town had um, paid six months uh, for kids in crisis counselor when there was no service. So given everything that you just said, how do you address that particular question? I mean, because in July and August, mm -hmm. There is no kids in crisis counselor, whether they're employed or not. There's just no one at schools at that time, right? Mm -hmm. So we get those services from kids in crisis in the summer. And it was a grant, so it was paid out over a 12-month period. Sure. So so just I just want to clarify for anyone watching in the public that you know how that went, that how that transpired. Sure. So I can only speak to what I know, right? Which is that the town has had 1.0 kids in crisis counselor in the budget for um, for years, right, since 2008 or, beyond, or before, mm -hmm. and they paid 1.0. That, at the high school, the position wasn't filled, mm -hmm. but there was a position at the middle school during that time, during the school year. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's paid, I don't know how it's paid. If it's invoiced over 12 months, the, I know that it's $96,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And I, if it's whether it's September to June or July 1 to June 30th, if that 96 is spread out over 12 or 10 months, that we, we've never paid kids in crisis directly before. Okay. So that's new for us. When we received the invoices for last year, there were, um, I believe, three invoices of 32,000 each that we paid. Uh, but I don't know if that represented July to June or September to whenever, but I know it was $96,000. So I don't think it changes the cost. Um, do, are we paying for the, uh, the summer months that we're not using? You know, I don't know. I will say that if there is a crisis and somebody calls uh, 211 or whatever needs access to crisis in the region, they are able to do that in the summer time. Um, but those details, I don't know. I have not... Um, I've not been in contact directly with Kids in Crisis about these specifics, right? But I do know that um, we've had 1.0 in the district since 2021 mm -hmm. uh, till November, whether it was at Saks or the high school, you know, depending. In 21, 22 was only the high school. Beginning of this year was only Saks. Now it's the local. 
Deanna, can you speak to that? Sure. So, and this is all pre-K to me. <laughs> Just so we all make it very clear, this is all before I was even in office. Um, I think maybe December, yeah. but I wouldn't have known. So, um, my understanding is that kids in crisis build the town. So we, they, the accounting department in town was paying them for the high school position that HHS pays for. And then the, you know, the agreement was the grant was going to pay for the SAS position. The town paid for the whole semester. So 32,000 for the high school position where no one was there. The agreement with the Board of Ed is that because there has been a position at SACS for the full year, in order to okay. pull the budget and pay kids in crisis and also get kind of reimbursed for what we overpaid, we would contribute the 32000 that we had already paid kids in crisis and they hold on their books. And then the Board of Ed would contribute their grant money or, you know, 64000 to pay for the SACS position that hadn't been paid through the grant. Um, so they are netting the 96 and getting full pay for the full year for the SACS. And then we will continue to pay as a town for the remainder of the year for the SACS Kids in Crisis Counselor on the town's, sorry, the high school kids in crisis counselor on the town side through the end of this school year. And then, then there's a different arrangement. Thank you. I don't so know does that mean problem. there's a credit of some sort? Like we have the credit on the town side because we right. pay for an asset that wasn't there. Right. So that credit is being applied against the SACS kids mm -hmm. in crisis counselor for one quarter of 32,000. And then the, we will, the Board of Ed will pay the remaining two thirds, uh, 64,000 out of that grant. So that will pay for the SACs. Mm -hmm. And then the um, Health and Human Services right, picks up the high school position from the date that they started, whatever mm -hmm. program they So net, we're paying no more than 96,000 this year as a town mm -hmm. for right. kids in crisis counselor that was budgeted. Mm -hmm. And is there a contract that spells out? No. No. Will there be one? Um, there's a lot of things to work out with uh, kids in crisis. But so I, I don't really want to deal with that side of it because I think there's some some issues we need to work out with that organization. But um, but no, I'll just be quite frank. What, what kind of issues? Because I heard that they're open to a contract. Uh, they might be. Yeah. But I, I have strong issues with an organization that bills you and doesn't provide a resource and and you know i have significant issues control issues i have control issues from the town i have oversight issues i have oversight issues of who's watching these counselors who knows what there's they're doing in the schools the fact that we didn't even know they weren't there and they were getting paid and no one said anything is a major red flag to me but i think it was said in the human health and human services meeting that there was no counseling there. So there wasn't, and no one knew. What my issue is, we were paying as a yeah. town for a rep, for a resource that no one knew wasn't even there. No one notified the accounting department or health and human services. So the fact that no one knew that there was not a resource there, at least on the town side, and we were continuing to pay for a resource, and Kids in Crisis was continuing to build the town for a resource that they weren't providing is a major control and oversight issue in my mind. Yeah, my understanding is a grant over 96, it's 96,000, so it was paid out every month and that they were trying to hire someone at the high school. So I don't- right, That's I, a grant for SACS, not yeah. for the high school. They're two different positions and paid for differently. So um, you may, be, you know, the grant is for SACS right. and that is 96,000 for a grant. The town pays them, not out of a grant. And that's the difference. And so that, that is the major issue I have. So what's the kind of like, what do we learn from this in terms of going forward? What's the control system that needs to be put in to place? Because it seems to me that this is, you know, it was announced in all the HHS meetings that the counselor wasn't showing up. 
So that was that was like, you know, is there like a form that someone fills out and says, you know, go to the finance department and say, hey, you know, um, we're not paying this or I mean, what what is the system? In it's, place? It's, we've already, it's, yeah, it's being worked out with the, with finance. I mean, there's going to be a major overhaul um, in how this works just on the town side for next year for the 1.0. Yeah. So, so in my view, you can't really blame kids in crisis for that. I well, mean, I can blame them for billing us when they didn't provide an asset. But people bill me all the time that I don't pay it if I don't receive okay. services. I'm just saying. I, I just I don't think we want to know that. Out that there was no resource there. So, you know, our accounting department would never know that there's not a HHS resource there unless HHS notified the accounting department. And I don't want to, I mean, there's all kinds of issues. I mean, we're digging into this and I don't want to blame anyone. I don't want, but there needs to be a major shift. And I think there's many things that need to be reviewed. And I think we're going to take next year to review and kind of get a better handle on, you know, sort of all our human resources um, that we have in the schools and, and through HHS. I think that's a good transition, if I can, to sort of where we are and what we think for next year. Can I, can I, I ask one really quick question? And I understand you're, it's under review, Deanna, but have they responded as to why? Did they give it a reason why they were charging? And I mean, was it, did, did uh, the prices give it a fresh amount? Was that? We're not, we'll, we'll work through it, Rita. It's, it's, it's been very convoluted and we're still working through it. Not true. Oh, that is not true. Someone else can speak. Jen, no, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I it, that's a, it's just, it's, Sorry, it's, Jen, it's an accusation. Right now, it's an accusation out there. I think we do need to clear it up one way or the other to know exactly what happened. So I understand you're reviewing it, but at some point, we'll probably didn't even get what that story actually is. Um, Eric, you had a comment? Yeah, I just want to go back to the, and I'm new to all of this, um, and I'm glad that we're going to look at the, $32,000 that was paid, but shouldn't have been completely agreed, shouldn't have been paid. I don't know what all that was surrounded, but I'm glad we're looking into it. We're going to fix that and, and fix the, the system. Uh, Dr. Leitzer, you mentioned that during COVID or right after the town, did the town or Duquesne Public Schools get a grant from the state of about $1 million? The Board of Ed. The Board of Ed. Duquesne Public Schools. So even with two of these counselors for two years, there's still 600 grand to be accounted for. Where did all the rest of that money go? Oh, that's a whole nother discussion. I'm glad to have it. And we have broken it out. We've had all kinds of tables and we can add that to our and just questions. just so you know the um so the the kids and Christ counselors at high school that's been around since for at least yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Um again that that has been uh that's a long standing position that was not in discussion around addition of one over exacts. And it was because yeah. we had it, but you know, we and the understanding was that the, we knew they were short term grants uh, back in 2021 when this all was being, you know, given, being given to districts and how we can spend them. So that's where we thought, you know, it's a good idea to run a pilot for a couple of years, see how it works, see if it's the right move for us, and then make a decision around do we continue this position or do something else? Mm -hmm. So it was always meant to be a pilot as we did this over at the middle school. Uh, as we ran a couple of things, and then we had to make some tough decisions about with the, the grant sunsetting, what do we continue in our operating budget, or what do we feel like we have covered elsewhere that we would not continue? Because we, when we used the grants, we didn't want to create a fiscal cliff by just hiring a million dollars worth of staff, and then two years later yeah. saying, oh, we need an extra million dollars on a budget to cover all these new staff. So we really were thoughtful about things like the summer academy that we ran, um, some testing that we did, some other um, services that we provided using that, that were services that we knew would sunset. And then there's some, a couple of ways that we hired some staff and we made some decisions around some that would continue and some that weren't. It makes this year's budget trickier than normal, just so you know, because in our staffing plan, we include everybody, all the positions grant funded or elsewhere um, and operating. And so now when we look from the year to year budget, it may look like an addition of you know X, but it's actually an operating budget of X plus whatever positions we're continuing. So it complicates that decision a little bit more. So, or that conversation. Does that help? I don't know. Complication is the name of the game. I understand. Yeah, that, 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 that. it's our job to try to cut through the kind of yeah. make everything as simple as possible, but no simple. Um, Reid, I'll call you one second. I just wanted to say about the um, the lack of a contract actually is in kids in crisis's defense in a way because who knows what their terms are. So, I mean, in their defense, yeah, maybe that right. was their understanding. But on the other side, where's the services for the, for the kids? 
throughout the summer. So are they, the, I mean, this is my, my question. Are they the only organization in town that offers counselors? You know, and is there one that might do 24 seven for the whole? Well, I will say kids in crisis is going to the school. Yes, it's an eye-opening question. Kids in Crisis Counselor has provided excellent service for us in high school. They have. They've provided a service that uh, has been value-add for our kids, for the school, uh, and they've done it for a while. One of the challenges when you outsource this position at all is turnover and relationships mm -hmm. and evaluation and those other pieces. At the high school, uh, it's worked quite well. Right. So now, so I'm moving to next year a little bit. At the middle school, we found to get it's this is nothing about the person in the role. The person's doing a fantastic job, but we're really looking for that person to operate more like a school social worker, like we have them operating, than we do with the high school kids in crisis counselor because the needs are different. Mm -hmm. The um, primarily what the kids in crisis counselor high school gives us is a, a place that kids can go to talk to somebody confidentially that's not um, their guidance counselor or their school counselor. And not the person writing their college recommendation, not somebody that's going to be sitting in their classroom later on, that whatever that might be. So it gives them that little bit of separation, which is important. Um, with Susan Bliss, Dr. Bliss actually went and ran some focus groups with kids at both levels, at the high school and middle school. And really, the, the students that she spoke with at the high school were all echoing this um, mm -hmm. practice, right? That if we have somebody that comes up we don't want to talk to a counselor about, we still have somebody we can go to with the kids' crisis counselor. And, uh, and they're glad to have it there and they feel... You know, that it's effective that way. In the middle school, then it was a different conversation. Yeah. And there really was a lot more overlap between the role of the school social worker and the kids in crisis counselor. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm going into next year, but as we consider- Before you do that, let me talk to let, let Rita have a chance to- well, it's on a roll. Okay. <laughs> All right, Rita. <laughs> no, and actually you're kind of answering it. My, I mean, my question was really, were we satisfied with the, the services we were getting at the high school level from, if, if, we, were, if we were satisfied with the kids in crisis, um, role that we were getting at the high school. It sounds like we were satisfied. There was a value that there that we need that we felt we needed and we were getting. Okay. And so that isn't, so that isn't, I just wanted to establish that. So that isn't in question, really, what is in question right now is not changing that, not taking that away, not questioning that necessarily. It's the just the sex role that we're thinking about now, changing, right? I think you're, you're, given... you're, not, you're not worried about oversight or evaluation for the high school kids in crisis counselor. You know, a high school is set up differently. The partnerships, the, the team comes together differently. The way they work, different, art is different. But even the proximity of the counselor to the, uh, the kids in crisis counselor to our counselors and nurses, other things. So it's a, it's a different setup. So no, I don't, I don't, it's, and I don't want to say worried about supervision evaluation. I just see that as a strength of in-house versus, right. out. but yeah, I think that there are some things that need to be clarified for sure. I mean, we're hearing them now. And I think that getting around the table with, uh, you know, kids in crisis with uh, the first selectman with a few other folks and really hammering out um, an agreement that's very clear and precise, I think is important uh, because we all, we would always do that. I think part of this is the legacy of this program at the high school being 20 plus years old, I believe, uh, means that just over time, you know, it's, it's a different relationship then. We're in a different world now. And I think that we do need to sit with them and work all this out. And as you, as you mentioned, I don't imagine there'll be any issues with doing that. I think that they are um, as pleased with the relationship with the high school as we have been through the years. And I think it's, it's a very much a, a mutually positive relationship on behalf for our kids. And, they, and their mission is the right, is a, a laudable mission. Right, they're here to help kids and help families. So we so want I'm, to- I'm sorry if I'm belaboring this. So, but again, I just want to confirm. There's no, there isn't a concern right now with the high school position and we're focusing on sex or am I hearing that you want to reevaluate that as well at the high school? So there is no concern that I know of for the high school position right now. Okay. Um, the, the either having it or the person in it, both positive feedback on both things. Okay. All right. Now, uh, right. So high school, so going to sex, the question became, again, it was always meant to be a pilot, and the question became, how can we best serve the students that we have there? And after thinking about it, talking to the team, talking with others, working through, we really feel that, I feel that, the what's best to meet the needs of the children there 
is for us to uh, have a 1.0 social worker who works for the district. Now, just, I'm gonna go back a little bit and I hate to confuse things, I hope I'm not. So pre-pandemic, we had 2.0 positions at SACS doing the kind of work I'm talking about, 2.0 social workers. Before you go on, Brian, I just oh, wanna say, support. no, <laughs> we're just leading into the next topic. I just wanna make sure I'm we're, we're moving along, so. I'm still, I'm still kids in crisis, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're, but done, we're done with that part of kids in crisis. Do you want to see if there are any questions before I do? Does anyone have any questions before we move on to Hillary? How this yeah. impacts staffing? Hillary. Go ahead, Hillary. Are you? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, if I heard you correctly, Dr. Latsy, one of the issues with the the gap in services at the high school with kids in crisis was an inability to find someone to fill the position. How confident are you? in the district's ability to find someone to fill the middle school position outside of using an agency like Kids in Crisis. Okay, so you're bringing me to where I was going. So if you oh, perfect. Have, like Hillary, I'll get there. No, it's perfect. It's actually the perfect question. She's a plant. Did you plant her? No, right now. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'll answer by saying barely, but we'll get there. So. Pre-pandemic, we had 2.0 FTEs, two people doing this work at SACS. Post-pandemic, like today, we have four people doing it. So we have the two positions we had. We have an additional school social worker who was hired through those COVID grants that are sunsetting. And we have the Kids in Crisis Council. So today we have four. What the budget next year supports right now, before we go to the Board of Finance, hopefully, is two positions at SACS with the understanding that the third would be filled by the Kids in Crisis Council at SACS. Now, given all this conversation we've had and, and what we're thinking about, and the question really was what best serves, serves the needs of the kids, what we are um, going to be asking Board of Finance to do is to uh, add $68,000 into our budget proposal so that we can keep the third social worker position at SACS. So we had two, we went to four. In 24, 25, we'd have three. And that's that would be without the kids in crisis counts. So, and the reason why we feel that it's a better move is it does give us stability. We have somebody in that role right now who's doing a fabulous job. And again, both people are doing a great job. The kids in crisis counselor is, this person is. So it's not, this is not personnel driven at all. And I, you know, those that know me know I don't make decisions based on personality, I make decisions based on systems and services and outcomes. So it gives us stability because it's somebody who works for us. It, give, it gives us the ability to um, supervise and evaluate, train, um, and build capacity on, on long-term with this person uh, in the hope that they would be here to develop relationships with kids and families and staff and we, we just see that as more value added at the middle school than going through an agency, whether kids in crisis or anybody else. And yes, I'll to your question, we, somebody is serving the role right now. So our original budget actually had us eliminating that role. And now what we're saying is we'd like to keep that role in, keep that person in that role who's doing a fabulous job and continue forward that way. Any questions? So just, just, sorry, just so I'm clear. So we, we have four now under this proposed budget, we would go down to a head count of three on this particular issue or uh, profession. Yeah. I, we had two pre-pandemic. We yep. were four using the grants and we're looking at three in 24, 25. With the understanding also that, you know, if needs emerge that are not being met, then in another few months, we're back in the budget cycle. So we can have that conversation as well if the need, need arises. But we feel pretty confident given the work we've done, the research, the focus groups that Dr. Bliss has held with students and otherwise, that this sets us up well going into next year. But Dr. Lutzi, that third, you would have lost one of them because of the grant. The grant was going away. So they're now paying for a grant funded position. So. The plan was always to have three there. Right. Right. So the plan was, even in the in the Board of Ed budget as it stands today, we were going from three 
people working for us in, in this area to two because the kids in crisis would be the third. So we we're going to, we're going to have three people. We're saying I'd rather have all three of them, our employees, instead of having two employees and one outsource. But you had two outsource this year? I'm, I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm so oh, so remember that. Well, so remember we had, we had the COVID grants. Yeah. And our, they're ending at the end of this fiscal year. They're done. We can't, there's no more money left. So we had was to going to one position and KIC was the other position. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm yeah. trying to follow the bouncing ball. I had a whiteboard. I could sketch it out for everybody. <laughs> I think the important thing to know is that based on your budget request, they are now the same as where they were going to be. But instead of having an outsourced social worker, they're going to have an insourced social worker that they will have um, development and control over versus an outside company that we just pay and don't have any control over as you know a district. Do the hours of service, uh, are they equal to what kids in crisis could offer? Well, we'll uh, always have access to the 800 number. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's open to anyone. You don't even have to be a kids in crisis subscriber, but we do fund kids in crisis. That 800 number is open to anyone. And we do still have a relationship with them. You... Right, and we still have our relationship yes. with them through the high school. Mm -hmm. Right, so again, we're only returning to where we were pre-2021 with kids in crisis, we still, again, have, we want the counselor at the high school. They've mm -hmm. done a great job and there's a value there that we need and our kids benefit from. Um, so we're, we're just returning back to, we, again, we ran it as a pilot, we learned from the pilot and we're making decisions based upon what we learned. Mm -hmm. I think that's what part of our responsibility. Right? Not everything is additive all the time. We want to make sure that we're making informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Just to wrap up, and I think you just said this, but I want to hear it again. There will be no diminution of services to students at SACS in the in this coming budget. This budget is whole as presented by the Board of Education with 3.0 social workers at SACS. And you think that does it? That that's that's that meets the need? We believe that that's the right model for staff given given where we are. Again, we had a fourth this year with kids in crisis. So I don't wanna say there's no diminution of services, but I will say that given what we know based on the research study that we've done, students will be served uh, well and appropriately with the staffing model that we have, that we have put forward. Hillary. I, one last quick question. It's just something that's been ringing in my ear. When, mm -hmm. When we talk about control and um, evaluation over a mental health provider, I, I would assume that doesn't mean any sort of breach of confidentialities or uh, topics that the social worker is not allowed to talk to students about or things like that. I, I don't understand. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Yeah, this is, okay. you know, it's um, it, the relationship between our counselors, counselors and our students and our families is all guided by all of FERPA and HIPAA and everything else. And yeah, they would never violate that. They do, there was a question I saw about um, mandated reporting and requirements around mandated reporting for kids in crisis versus our folks. And they are, they're similarly trained. The expectations are the same about mandated reporting to DCF if and when they were hear things about, you know, students at danger to self or others or students being harmed, all of those pieces. So. The training is, is um, similar, if not identical, and the expectations are equally um, high, and appropriately high, that DCF will be notified in the right way. So then we don't lose any of that um, kind of oversight or protection over children one way or the other. I think there is one fundamental difference in, um, is that kids in crisis is confidential unless a child is at risk of harming themselves or uh, others. So there is a difference in the service provided um, to a middle school student, right? Because a social worker is not confidential. So if someone goes to kids in crisis, whether they're in middle school or high school, it goes, uh, it, it's confidential. If they go to a school social worker, it, I'm assuming it goes in the school record and it's a different kind no, of situation. Not always. I mean, it's, they, they may have their personal records that they keep for whatever reason, but okay. students can go to their school social worker otherwise and ask for it to be kept confidential. It can be as long as, again, they're not in a, you know, 
self-reporting or not with direct to themselves or anybody else. And you know, with all the different criteria, obviously you know well that you would go through. But uh, but yeah, we do have confidential conversations with kids through our counselors from time to time. Where you okay, I didn't know when appropriate because I think parents need to know what they're giving up. If you're giving up a kids in crisis counselor at the middle school, you're giving up that confidentiality piece. And I know I've anecdotally heard that some parents don't want their kids going to the school social worker. They prefer they go to the teen talk counselor. I understand it's a pilot and, and I, I totally get that. But post COVID there's a, you know, mental uh, illness issues are starting to creep into that population, you know, eight to 14 and it's, it's starting to get much more prevalent. So well, and, um, I'm just curious to know what the focus group said, because when I looked at the utilization numbers at the Teen Talk Counselor at SAC and at high school, they were very similar. And, but the issues were very different. Yeah. You looked at the distribution of the types of issues that kids were going to the Teen Talk yeah. Counselor at SAC. It yeah. was predominantly peer issues, yes. which is a very different than what was being dealt with at the high school. So I think you also need to kind of have all pieces of what they're dealing with um, at both schools. No, I did notice that the peer-to-peer -peer conflict was like 53% or something. Yeah. So you're saying that a school social worker would be yet better able to deal with that than a teen top counselor for some, I don't know. Just... If not better, equally. Equally. Right? Okay. So I think- And Kim, the... sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I took a look at this. There is a there is a Connecticut general statute that deals with confidentiality rules for licensed clinical social workers, assuming that's what we would hire, I hope. Um, and it's they're bound by the same confidentiality rules, harm to self or others, if they're subpoenaed in a civil lawsuit that the student is bringing, um, a couple of other, uh, other things that are pretty standard for mental health providers. Yeah, all, all mental health providers have those, um, you know, limits on confidentiality, Hillary. It's not just- yeah. just what I'm talking no, about. No, I understand. Yeah, I get, the, yeah. You know, going into the school record. It's a different issue that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, the- Fair point. It's, oh, I'm sorry, but part on, on feedback from the kids and how they're using the counselors and feeling that, again, with the all things being equal, having someone on staff gives us added value to that kids, including the, um, we anticipate being able to have somebody on staff for a long period. And turnover, when I, you know, when I was in high school, we had the same concert for a long period of time, but since then there's been a bit of turnover. It's, as you know, it's a very challenging market. It's hard to hire folks into these roles. Uh, and we, you know, we found some good people and we want to hold on to them. Janet. Yeah. Hi, um, Janet. Hi. Hi, Dr. Letzi. Um, quick question. From a kid's stand standpoint, do they see any difference between an in-house versus an outside agency? Or is it the same? Do they do they feel any more confident going to a kids in crisis counselor versus a social worker? Or is it is it no different? As far as I know, and again from the feedback I got from Dr. Bliss, they really we're talking about 10 year olds, 11 year olds, 12 year olds. So no, I don't think that, that nuance is really part of their thinking so much over there. I think that uh, if they were working in fundamentally different ways, it might be more so but they're really not so i don't know that kids say well this person is kids in crisis this one works for the district okay. somebody else this one the guidance counselor i mean that's i think these are probably much more adult nuances than, than things that impact the kids okay. and are we in fact saving money by going in-house versus outside agency is it 68 so, pounds versus 96 or is, is the 68 or whatever it is not including benefits so what I do believe we are saving money in that, and that, you know, the bank does include benefits, but 68 is the salary. But as you know, being self insured, that's a whole different thing. It's not really a one to one and how the pool works and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's less than 96,000. You know, it's uh, we put in 68, uh, and that's, you know, a little bit higher than what we typically put in for a new position because somebody's in the role now and, you know, what have you. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you could say we're saving money, but then last night they asked, does that mean the budget goes down? And it doesn't mean the budget goes down because the money doesn't exist anywhere right now. <laughs> so just to be, again, just to overcomplicate a complicated thing. Um, but yes, on the whole, and actually we found that insourcing a variety of different roles strategically does help with the budget. You know, I mean, there's definitely always conversation about, you know, staff increase, why is the staff increasing? But really, it's, that's only one thing to consider. And the other piece is to look at your overall for people expenditures and cost in relation to others. 
And so, you know, we have been strategically increasing our staff, but we've been doing it as we've increased or modified or enhanced programs. And as a result, we've kept, kept kids in district, provided them with great education and actually driven some costs down on the whole, which uh, I think is a good story to tell. Well, and, okay. and I think it's important to think about, you know, in a, in a time when mental health professionals are, you know, really at a premium, um, the district will be paying that individual more than what kids in crisis is paying that individual. Kids in crisis has a lot of overhead. And so I would argue we would probably get a more, uh, a more experienced or a more high quality um, counselor in the district when the district um, hires, trains, and oversees than if we have this outside agency that really is paying these younger counselors, and they are very young, as uh, the, the two that I met at a recent Behavioral Health Alliance meeting, very young counselors. Okay. Um, Christina has a question, and then Rita, and then I think we'll move on for kids in crisis. I just wanted to understand, is the salary for a social worker in this capacity only 68000 So the social workers hired you on the teacher's contract. Right. So they're in the they're certified by the state of Connecticut. They're part of the NCEA. Right. So their experience would determine exactly where they're hired based on step as so, a as a teacher. And I assume to be a social worker, you have to have a master's. Yeah, and, be, just and be certified. Very, in yes, it just seems like very low salary. No wonder we can yeah. get a hold of them. Yeah, very hard to hire in mental health. It's it's short. Short. Oh, there's a big story. Right. So you can imagine LCSW with a master's. Working for sixty-eight thousand. Yeah. Well, but then there, there are other benefits, of course, of being in a school system, and you know, hope that over time, as their salaries increase and other, and it might, you know, they as additional certifications, others all contribute towards that. But yeah, that's that's the model. Sounds good. Rita. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious about like uh, ref referrals to outside resources. So, is there a difference between like a kids and crisis counselor that can refer or that would refer to outside resources versus a school counselor. And the reason I'm asking that is because I know like, and this is like from a personal experience, the, and I don't know if it was a school counselor, but the school official felt, did not feel it appropriate to refer a child to outside resources because of potential legal liability. That was that was expressed. I'm just curious, like, is there any limitations from a school counselor referring to outside resources? Like, I think this person may, this child may need these services or may benefit from the services versus a, a kids in crisis counselor. So it, it's actually a great question. It calls one other thing to mind, but no, if somebody asks for a referral list or referrals, we'll give them a couple of different options. We won't say use this one, but we will say, you know, here are three that we've had great success with or something like that. Uh, if they, if uh, the another part of the thinking around this is that the urgent assessment program that we have now over at Silver Hill, right? So again, you don't you don't think about any of these things in isolation. It's all kind of a network of support for kids and families. So that does have a role to play in that sort of. Uh, it's not the the you know nine one one call immediately, the two one one call immediately, but it is we have concerns and you know we can refer folks to there uh, for sure as well. The we probably would not have a school social worker calling a family to say, I think your kid needs counseling. I think your child needs this or that. Um, but they would prob probably that's not happening um, unless they are. The, but if parents talk about services with them, then they can engage in that discussion. So there could be something there. Rita. It's probably worth me learning a little bit more about. Uh, but to an, an earlier point. Um, I wanted to make briefly is the model right now is that we have the 1.0 kids in crisis counselor at the high school five days a week, you know, 182 days a year. But there may be a model where we share that service 80 20, maybe they're one day a week over at SACS and four days at the high school or something else. I think this all has to be part of the conversation that we have with kids in crisis to see if there's any value to, uh, to doing something like that. Thank you. So Rita, should we switch gears here? Yeah, I think I think we've <laughs> beaten this horse. 
Does anyone have any questions on staffing? I think we kind of touched on staffing and we gave a lot of questions to Brian, which I think will require probably more detailed written response. So I think we'll move past that. So insurance, does anyone have any questions on insurance? Okay. Well, I mean, I don't want to start on that one. I mean, honestly, just hearing all the emails that have been. A lot of questions from citizens in town, and I applaud you for your patience and your your determination in answering. Those questions. Thank you. I've known us for a long time. Those, those questions have been asked since I was on the board yes, in yes. 2013. Yes, and and um, I don't understand this all the intricacies of different insurance programs and administrators. Um, I've got to trust that you and your team uh, and board of finance understand that better than the average Joe on the street, which is where I fall. So that the self-insured program is actually a more cost-effective program for the Canaan Public Schools at this time. Right. As I learn more and get more educated, I may grow in that understanding and change my mind. But for now, I, 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 it's a lot of work. I know that in the past we have had Joe, your what is it, consultant, the consultant, come in and have a conversation about how it works as a result. Is short and maybe it's time to do that again and schedule a meeting. For some so, council meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is usually an open discussion as to how it works and to answer any questions. Um, yeah. I, I think that's a good idea because we, even with a visit to the Board of Finance, because Joe came to the Board of Finance, we spent about 90 minutes going through all of it, but it was very detailed, precise, specific, actuarial language for the Board of Finance. Mm -hmm. This might be a half, just a half step back about philosophy and self insurance. And, you know, it does just one way to think about it is the, um, and you know, this goes in the category of things they didn't teach you in superintendent school, right? So you learn along the way. Um, but when you when you self-insure, you're going to have some good years, and you're going to have some years that you you pay more because you really are you're accepting the responsibility to pay the claims of the participants. Right? So, but what you don't have to pay for is the margin that insurance companies build into their plans because you can while we'll win some years and lose some other years. Insurance companies are always going to build a margin. They're not going to lose, right? They wouldn't last very long if they did. Um, so you do take on that risk, and then you figure out ways to mitigate some of that risk with some of the reinsurances and things like that that we use um, over time. And Joe has done analysis of this for us, and I'll get the information for you the way I'll have him share it with you. Um, but we've saved well in excess of $10 million over the last, say, eight, 10 years uh, by a couple of you know, decisions that we've made by being self insured. Had we been fully insured, we wouldn't have been able to. Um, save those those funds because we would have been paying no money to the insurance company. And just a very simple example that I think is easy to uh, wrap wrap your arms around. You know, we during the pandemic when that hit and everything shut down, um, we didn't spend the money out of the account that we had for our insurance. So we effectively saved over two million dollars just that one year because of that. Had we been fully insured. That money wouldn't have saved something with us. We would have had to still pay our premiums, pay the insurance company, they would have that money. And so it's, and that's just one easy example, but there's lots of examples. Mm -hmm. And so we, over time, we always, in negotiation with our teachers, look to uh, sort of tighten up the plan in reasonable ways. And so we've done things such as we have a copay for participants when they reach their deductible. So it's a high deductible health care plan. And, and this, we're one of the only board of eds in Connecticut that I'm aware of, um, or municipalities for that, for that matter, uh, that have this copay after which is deductible. And that alone saves us well over $300,000 per year in the cost of our plan through Sigma and when we do our projections, all those things. So it's, it's those kinds of modifications we look to make over time through negotiations with our teachers and other, other staff that help us to continually um, evolve the plan. The, there are some towns that use the state partnership plan. Uh, this came out a few years ago. First selectman was chair of the board at the time. And we looked, we took a good look at it. And we made the decision that this wasn't right for the king. Uh, we also, I've done a little bit of research around collaboratives. And we went actually a couple of years ago, I went to a lunch meeting with a collaborative uh, group of the folks that run it to learn more about it. It really seems 
seem to be the time that the climbers are really beneficial to small groups that are looking to broaden their pool. But for us, our costs are our costs. You know, when we pay for our, our claims, it's just going to be what it is. There's nothing we can work to try to build in changes of behavior that lead to better health outcomes. But ultimately, whether you're using Cigna or Aetna or United Healthcare, whatever you're using, whatever they've negotiated with their partners is the rate that you're going to pay for whatever services they provide. Uh, we did get hit pretty hard in the pandemic with a few very significant health issues. We had one individual with a double lung transplant. We had a heart transplant. We had, uh, and we had a few um, deaths of members in the plan, including teachers. Um, all of that served to really hit our reinsurance, our stop loss very hard, which is why we really focused there on how, what, what can we do to try to bring those costs down. So what happened in the year we got the card, we paid about $700,000 for a policy that paid us about $2.5 million. So we won that year. But now the, the insurance companies, of course, they have all that data and they want to recoup those costs. So that's where we're, we're talking about stop loss and other things. Like that. What is your stop loss? So our, we've got two, right? So we have so we have a pool of funds that we use to pay our claims, mm -hmm. and then we have an individual stop loss. So that's for any one individual plan participant. We've got about sixteen hundred of them. If they we the plan pays for them up to three hundred thousand dollars, and then anything over three hundred thousand dollars is paid by that individual stop loss carrier. We also have an aggregate stop loss. And that's what we talk about, the corridor and reserves and all that. That's going from 100% of our anticipated claims to 120%. That's our corridor because once we hit 120%, the aggregate stop loss carrier pays 100%. We've never hit 100%, I mean 120%. We typically have often hit 100%, but we haven't hit 120 And so that cost on the aggregate is significantly less by the factor of 10 or more than the individual stop loss because we do hit that annually and it's just a question of the number of people who will. Now, and not, you know, just remember, superintendent, not insurance consultant, but uh, I've had enough conversations with them to know part of, first of all, nationally, all of the large carriers are struggling with higher costs than, than in the past. They're trying to figure this out and they will. I mean, they've got lots of really good minds working this working problem. Um, but what's hitting us now is what's hitting everywhere. And it's a good problem to have, just not financially, but people that are um, being diagnosed with illnesses that led to uh, shorter lifespan now are living quite a bit longer thanks to you know, medicine. new medicine. Yeah, biologics and other medicines that weren't available just a couple of years ago. So you're going, you're, Somebody who wouldn't be on the plane for very long now could be on and still continue to work and be here and be healthy enough to live a good life. But if they may be, it may cost five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year in those biologics, in those prescription meds. Mm -hmm. So that's giving them a plan. Again, it's a good problem to have for the individual, and it's a good problem for society. It's tough financially, so we're just trying to figure that. And the same goes with other prescription medications that are available that are now helping people in a variety of different ways that just that weren't available just a few years ago. So that we do a deep dive on our insurance planning's performance annually with Sigma. We spend a day together. They buy us lunch. It's very nice. And uh, we look at these sit the sort of the trends and what's happening and really try to continue to plan around sort of plan design a bit, but really around behavior. So we have a, a wellness committee that's in place spend with a couple of years, does an amazing job with our staff. And we put an um, employee assistance program in place in EAP. And we really worked with Cigna to say, we want this available to everybody in our district, whether or not they're on the Cigna insurance plan. So any employer in the public schools has access to the EAP. And do, so we've done things like that to try to, um, some behavior coaching, some other things. So based on the medication that somebody might be taking, Cigna will reach out to them, offer them a coach, offer them support, and do a variety of different things now. So we really we use Tom, try Tom, to and Rita have had their hand up. Okay, I'll take it right. I get. I, 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 I want to put everything I don't want to take. Tom, go ahead. Well, I thought I thought. Dr. Lutzi was doing really well because in the course of his discussion, he answered one of my questions. That's what I was wondering. I was <laughs> uh, so, Dr. Lutzi, my impression has been in looking at this for the last five years um, and listening to similar presentations, uh, that if you cut through the complexity 
uh, the most important question is how much people are spending on medical care, right? That, that that's everything else revolves around that. This year, that and, and in past years, we, if I if I understand it correctly, we've actually been fortunate enough or clever enough that our trend of of, of growth in healthcare expenses, uh, claims reimbursements, uh, has been lower than the national average, right? It's and, actually quite a bit lower than the state average, as right? Well. You so, go back, turn it out. We're again millions below where the state average spend would have us. So we pat ourselves on the back, uh, and we've also been able to look at at the um, the realities of volatility. Things go up, things go down. We've we've talked about reasons for that, and it all sort of made sense. However, this year, it's a spike. It's like it's like new territory. And so the real question is, and maybe you touched on it with the evolution of medical technology. Uh, is this the new normal? Because it's a lot more expensive, even given all those other factors, uh, changing uh, the, you know, the employee's use of the plan and more intelligent use of the system and whatever, all those positive incentives. But it was so much this year, you have to wonder, is this a new normal? Is this pretty much where we expect to be? Yeah, you know, Tom, I think only time will tell. We hope not, but you're exactly right. And what we've seen is where we used to trend on average about 1.2 or so, 1.3 million a month in our spend. We have some months here where we're 1.6, 1.8. And those um, were not the months that we would expect to be that high or, or higher. Um, so we really are watching it closely to see, does this is this a new trend or is it just... Um, Something is this something else count for? Then one of our challenges in our plan, and I won't go too long, probably, one of our challenges in our plan is the $300,000 stop loss is a high number. It means any one participant can cost the plan $300,000. So if you have uh, two or three people on it that you didn't expect, you didn't budget for to hit that, you know, that's close to it's a million dollars. It's not going to be $900,000 if it's just three people they didn't account for in the plan to hit that. So um, that's, it's always a give and take and we find that number. Because of our experience, it would be cost prohibitive to bring it down. Uh, we're paying an awful lot for it already. But that is, that's an element of risk in our plan that um, if you were to design a plan from the ground up today, you wouldn't start with $300,000 individual stop loss. Um, you might, you know, you've done, you've started. Isn't that what Joe said at the meeting? Was he saying there are different levels of stop loss? Yeah, and then to to it's about 150. Right. Joe has had to look at it, but I think the findings are here. But I think the finding will be that it's cost prohibitive. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, he did say that 300 were amongst the highest that he knows of. Mm -hmm. And so we are, so again, um, I'm, I'm want, if you know what the Dunning Kruger curve is, I'm being very careful not to be on Mount Stupid, where I know a little about something and think I know a lot. Okay, so I want to just put that on the table. Uh, but in Joe's presentation, one of the things he taught me was that you have to look at it in two, two pools, essentially. Those that um, are below 50,000 and those that are above. And what he found was those that were above was, was around 4%, 3.5% or so, and it was driving about half of our spend. So our plan is running very well for our non-high high dollar claimants. And so really your leverage points and your continued refundment is what do we do with those high dollar claimants and how can we, whether it's behavioral or otherwise, try to manage those costs. And so that's where we had some conversation about is there a way that the reserves can help with this into the stop loss and maybe you can increase the the, even up to 400 if you had enough reserve to pay the three to four and that might save you enough this we're, we're meeting within a couple of weeks to work out those details but but i do want you to know given that or you mentioned the emails etc we are um i don't want to use the word obsessed but i'm pretty obsessed with this around insurance and all because i recognize it as a large driver in our budget and we have spent all we i spent a lot of time Identifying ways we can drive down operational costs to ensure that the funds remain in the classroom with kids in the schools where they're, they're best served. Right. So that's where we've done energy initiatives, we've done the lighting initiatives, we work with the church, all of these things that we do, we do it in service to kids and in the investments in the classroom. So this is as important as everything else because better we manage this, make sure that we can continue to make the investment where it cuts.
Okay, Rita and Hillary has her hand up. I'm not sure if she's. I think that might be an old one. Right? Um. So here's what I'd. <laughs> I really appreciated the last email that you sent. Brian, which really explained kind of the strategy and the approach that that you took to get to the decision we made about um, insurance. In my opinion, I'm not an expert. I, I'm not an expert in insurance, but I what I do appreciate is doing the research and having a strategy, right? Looking at the different options and having a and and coming up with a strategy that you think is best for our you know our community, which might be different from what other communities are doing. And it also, by the way, proves itself over time because you might have an up or a down year, but really uh, the true test of whether the strategy is working is more than just one year, right? It's seeing over time how it is performing. And so in my opinion, I've, I have plenty of information that tells me that we've done the due diligence, we've, we've, we've chosen a strategy that we think is effective and I'm seeing evidence that it was a good strategy. And so uh, that's where I sit right now. Um, could there be other strategies that we go after? Yeah, maybe, but I don't know that it's clear that one is definitely better than what we're doing right now. So, I mean, I, I guess I appreciate um, the fact that you've gotten that expertise from, I guess that was the, the gentleman, Joe, and that you've done the the research and and I'm, I'm yeah. So, I mean, that's where I sit from all, you know, and I will I, not to belabor the point, and thank you. I'm grateful. The um, when we looked at the state partnership plan, part of what factored into our decision making was, you know, it, as a board of education, we play the long. This is the long game. You know, we don't make decisions based on a six month or a twelve month thing necessarily. We know that we've been here a long time. We're going to be here a long time, and so we have to create strategies and give it time to work through. We can't be bouncing all over the place with the idea of the moment and lose sight of those longer term goals and the direction and the you know, sort of the purpose that we have. So that's I think that that's an important distinction, you know, for me certainly that the, the options that we have available to us today are based on the decisions we've made over the last 10 years. And every district will have a different set of options that they can choose from based on the decisions that they've made. But I'm telling you the consistency of the direction that we've been moving in. I serve the district very well and will continue to do so. It's not that we are always looking to way improve it, uh, but we're also not just jumping on a bandwagon because it's a fad and six months from now we're going to be. Right. One thing, I'm oh, sorry, I was wondering, as a result of all those emails, Cigna is the manager of the plan. Mm -hmm. Do you ever look at uh, comparing other managers? Like, is there some benefit to putting an RFP out for? other managers of the plan to see what that would do. Not that you want to do that every year, but like, you know. We have, we can look at it. Um, the thing is the relationship with Cigna is mature. So for instance, I mentioned the EAP, mm -hmm. right? So you're another district manager. We have 100% of the um, RX reimbursement comes back into our plan. We have to negotiate that. But there are lots of things like that that we can negotiate. It's also, um, you have to do a disruption analysis. As you know, this is, insurance is a benefit through the contract that our teachers and all of our uh, employees receive. And if you if you switch carriers, then it's a disruption in service for folks that can be um, different, be expensive and difficult to navigate as you make that transition because you've got grandfather people into places that may not have an agreement with that insurance company. So you're absorbing those additional costs and other things. So there are some things built in the system that make it very difficult to make this shift. We did look at it and I can go back. I don't know the, I don't remember exactly the details, but we did ask Joe to look at what it might be. He knows people, obviously this mm -hmm. is what he does. So he that, that would probably be helpful to hear the, just what it might look like. Yeah, I can, I can certainly ask him to do that for us. Um, mm -hmm. One of the challenges just to, again, knowing um, I'm no expert, but having spoken with some colleagues who have gone out to bid, changed their carrier, they get an excellent rate in the first year. And then the company recoups its losses in the mm -hmm. second year. So for us, we're not fully insured. So it's really just about the network. So it's not that we're, if we're fully insured and it's a $20 million plan, you know, maybe we're gonna save a percent, which means it's a lot of money and whatever. But for us, we don't, we're not paying that money to Sigma. 
where banks send that administrative fee to use their network and their GDA clearance. So it's their negotiated rates versus. Yeah, so it might be 250 I don't know exactly the numbers, but it's not millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So even if we save the percent, we might be saving a couple thousand. 250,000. Well, I don't look at it. Or a year. What's that? A month or a year? No, 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 for the year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it might be more than that. I have to look, but it's not It's not the number, it's not the 17 million we're talking about. That's the actual money that goes to the doctors and the places to pay the claims. Mm -hmm. We're really just talking about the administrator. And that's again the advantage of being self-insured, that we hold the funds, we hold the money. But if you're a if you're fully insured, uh, it, there may be more savings there because we're only using Sigma to use their network and their GDA claims and to you know help us to manage all that. You really you're not talking about a significant mm -hmm. number, even if you get an amazing savings rate. It's still only on that small portion of your spend and insurance. Mm -hmm. How often, yes, how often, if ever, is there an audit on Cigna and the claims process that they've done for the Board of Education? So we've done two different audits. We back, um, you may remember years ago, there was a question about folks who were working for one of the town agencies still on their insurance plan. Yes. Yeah. So when we saw that, we said, "Okay, we're going to audit ours right now before anybody asks us." To. Okay. So we did. Um, and we, we actually was surprising. They, we hired a company that said, don't worry, we're going to charge you. We use 35,000. We're going to save more than that because we're going to find a few people that shouldn't be on the plan and you're going to save the money. We didn't save any money. So it was, we were really in a very good place for that. Um, so we audited our, our utilization and that came out. We then, um, in response to some of the questions that Rich was asking, right. we audited uh, Cigna in our claims. And what we did, we did that, I mean, haven't looked at it in a few years, but essentially they sample the claims right. and they take it through from, you know, notification to Cigna to through payment, through payment through, and they, they do a sampling and go through all of that. And again, it came out uh, that things were running well. But that was how many years ago? Oh, it was pre-pandemic. You know, I think I just marked time with that these days. But, so what, um, what rings a bell to me is the fact that you said a little bit ago that your claims had increased to one to 1.4, 1.7 that it was creeping up. So maybe that is the time now to do a, an audit on the sampling. Yeah, I mean, again, there's a cost to it, but you can absorb that with the claim perhaps. And I'm, I'm, there's no, I'm always happy to do it. You know, information is always good to have. Uh, the... As I, as I mentioned, there's, I don't think there's a silver bullet out there, but yeah. just to be able to, you know, sort of do it at periodically every couple of years and get in the cycle of doing it, there's no one there. I think uh, it's 612, and to give you all a break for your next meeting, I think uh, any other questions that anyone has, just put them in writing and um, we'll go from there. Anyone have any quick final notes? Mike, did you want to say anything? <laughs> okay, so um, with that, do you have to make a motion to adjourn? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Does anyone want to make a motion? Make a motion to each other. Yeah. Yeah. All in favor? Well, thank you all. Thank you, baby. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. This is Sean. Sean. Okay. Oh, okay. Is that the next one? Oh, I mean, literally. Who said that? I seconded. Pat was like, okay.